الله يبارك فيك يا رب يحفظك ان شاء الله اي بسم الله والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين I wanted to reflect um, for a few minutes on the story of the people of the cave This is a story we've all heard about There are many lessons in it um, Various lessons in it So what we'll do is we'll go through an overview of the verses that you heard We'll just do a quick translation, make any points And then I have one main point that I want to, um, inshallah, address. So we'll go ahead and project those um, slides. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, which is translated here, have you, O Prophet, this is a, you know, a, a message to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and by extension, all of us and all of humanity. Have you thought that the people of the cave and the plague were the only wonders of our signs. Um, this is a rhetorical device in the Arabic language to say, of course, the story of the people of the cave, as amazing as it is, is not beyond God's ability. Uh, of course he can do that. So it, it's nothing to be too surprised by given Allah's uh, uh, power to do all of those things. So that's a rhetorical device to both show this is amazing, but don't forget, Nothing is too amazing for Allah. And right off the bat, the beginning of the Surah Kahf, which has, is supposed to be recited every Friday, what are we getting? Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for Allah. Not the freedom and liberation of our brothers and sisters in Philistine. Not the mending of your broken heart. Nothing is impossible for Allah, no matter how amazing and impossible it may seem to us in that moment. Next verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us about the young people, youth. How old were they? How young were they? I don't know. But in the Arabic, we know that a young person is young until the age of 40, right? That's when you stop being young. And that's a far healthier approach than modern society, okay? You're young until you're 40. So don't be like, I'm going to give up at 30. Oh, I'm in my 30s. You know, I'm done. <laughs> you're not done. You got all of this youthful energy until your 40s. And then, you know, we all know what happens. Once, once you hit your 40s, really, or even your 30s, you start slowing down a bit. So we don't know how young they are. And, and one of the things that we learn in this whole story is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to constantly pivot us away from details that may be unnecessary. What we know is they're young. And that's important. Beyond that, You know, the, the, the details, how long were they there? How long did they sleep? We know this is not necessarily a huge part of the lesson here. Now, these young people took refuge in the cave and said, Our Lord, grant us mercy from yourself and guide us rightly through our situation, our ordeal. What is the situation? Why did they end up taking refuge in the cave? We'll address this uh, very shortly. We'll go to the next verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in response, he caused them to fall into a very long slumber for many years. Some say a century onwards, century plus. You know, again, we have speculations. Uh, uh, that's not the important part of the story. But they were made to sleep for a very, very long time. Next verse. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, imagine being asleep for years and years. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises you up. Why did Allah do that? So that we may show which of these two groups would make a better estimation of the length of their stay and to be assigned. Next verse. And this story is a sign for what happened, a lesson in what happened. There were young people who believed in their Lord and we increased them in guidance. Now, this belief that they have manifested in a particular posture, in a composure. We're going to talk about that very shortly. Next verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in their faith, Allah strengthened their hearts when they stood up and declared. Now, I find this really beautiful because Allah could have said they had faith and Allah strengthened their faith. But he said they had faith and Allah strengthened their hearts, which shows you that in cultivating faith, 
our heart in all of its capacities is strengthened. So that's why Iman, the word faith, also means security. Aman, which is the idea of feeling secure, safe, safe within yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising the one who has faith and cultivates that faith in God. Their hearts, وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ You know, رَبَطَ is to tie. Right? Their hearts became firm in strength, right? Like a knot that's untieable, unknottable, or whatever. What, what is it, unknotting a knot? I, I, it's unknottable? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever word we're supposed to use. Um, and they stood up and declared, Our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. We will never call upon any God besides him next verse Allah says or we should truly be uttering an outrageous lot so so these people of the cave are saying of course this is what we're supposed to do stand firm in faith never associate partners with Allah or we would be uttering an outrageous lie to them persecution death the most severe consequences a human can face in life are better than uttering an outrageous lie so, you know, I wish President Biden was um, uh, listening to this session because clearly he does not care about a lesson like this. He'll quote a hadith before election, after election, in the midst of a genocide, just now, he will quote a lie, a verified lie about what happened, the beheading of babies, to stir up more fitna. And Allah says, well, fitna to min al -qatil. This formula of spreading chaos for self-interest, God says, is worse than you killing someone. Because that fitna will result in the massacre of many others. And it was the same disinformation that resulted in the murder of a six-year-old child, Palestinian child, Wadia, in Chicago. What was his them? What was his sin to be stabbed 17 times? Well, this is the consequence of outrageous lies. And this is why the people of the cave kill me, persecute me, do whatever you have to do. I will not live a lie. Wallahi, this is one of the most powerful, powerful, powerful lessons of our time. How many people are living in absolute delusion because they do not want their luxuries to be diminished. So it is easier for me to go and stand with an apartheid occupation. It's easier for me to go and do this or that because I don't want to lose social favor. I don't want to lose, you know, a, a monetary, I don't want to lose a business. I don't want to lose a customer. It's easier for me to do all of that and live an actual lie. Unlike these young people, young people who said, nope, uh, we would rather do all of that than utter an outrageous lie. Next verse. Then they said to one another, these people of ours have taken gods besides him. Why do they not produce a clear proof of them? Next verse. Who then does more wrong than those who fabricate lies against Allah? Look at this. You know, th this, is, this is why one of the Arabs, they say, you know, um, if you get accustomed to lying, if you get accustomed, I forget the exact quote, you get accustomed to lying, that is, you're literally unraveling the very foundations of your morality. Because the moment you get accustomed to lying, nothing matters anymore. Allah, just spread this lie, spread this lie, spread this lie. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad was so careful about this that he told us, it is enough for one to be called a liar if they simply relay everything they hear. This is why, remember, we're Muslim. No matter what's happening around the world, we hold ourselves to higher standards. Just because someone shared it on Instagram doesn't mean you automatically share it. What's going on? Is it true? Is it true? Can we verify it? Fact-checking is a sign of Iman. And the absence of that is a sign of the unraveling of our morality. So, because we might get accustomed to just share whatever... And not verify. It doesn't matter if the source is trustworthy. It doesn't matter if the source is credible. Just share because ends justify the means. Not in our religion. They don't. 
and never justify the means. We stand with our principles. And this is why it's very ironic that they're telling Muslims constantly to condemn Hamas. They're telling us to condemn this group and that group and this group and that group as if to say, right, we want to make sure, we want to make sure that you Muslims uh, 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 don't want to murder children if that happened. And again, Allahu A'lam what happened. You know, you can't trust anything the illegal occupation says, right? Because they, they're, they're pathological liars as a government. And it's not controversial to say that in the least. That is what they are. And so we don't want to deny what happened. What happened, happened. And if any innocent human being was murdered or killed, the fact that people are asking us to condemn this is deeply offensive. Why? Because unlike any civilization, Muslim civilization has been firm in our laws that did not change about the rules of combat from the beginning of the time of the Prophet ﷺ. No harming of children, no harming of women, no harming of elderly, no touching the mentally ill. You cannot harm non-combatants. You cannot burn trees. You cannot destroy infrastructure like Israel does with their carpet bombing of the largest open air concentration on the planet. This is all forbidden. So what do you think about innocent, uh, uh, an innocent person being murdered? What do you think about? You think, you think we're going to stand for that? When our entire civilization never engaged in any form of ethnic cleansing, for the most part. You know, Christians, I, I mentioned this the other day. You know, I, I'm Syrian. Uh, Syria took, you know, 300 plus years to become majority Muslim. If there was forced conversion, ethnic cleansing, genocide, uh, uh, if, if Muslims wanted to eradicate this or that ethnicity, how did that, how is that possible? Till this day, Christians in Syria live in the wealthiest areas of Syria, protected and safeguarded. This is our history. Knowing that that is our history, which reflects what our actual values represent and the laws represent, this is, why are you even asking us to, 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 to such, such offensive questions? And I say all this to say that we, because of that history, because of our iman, most importantly, we hold ourselves to higher standards. That we don't, um, we don't speak on the basis of tribal affiliation. We speak on the basis of truth and justice, and we are consistent in the way that we speak. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, it is enough for you to be called a liar, to just spread whatever you hear. Because that is so dangerous. And you're seeing it. You know, literally the president of the strongest country and military on the planet can stand there and peddle lies that have been verified as lies without, without even a flinching. Unlike that, we, uh, 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 we know what's going on. <laughs> we know what the propaganda machine is made up of and we commit ourselves to truth and it is far better for us to be persecuted and harmed than to live in, 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 in delusion, to live a lie. May Allah protect us from that. We'll go to the next verse. Since you have distanced yourselves from them and what they worship besides Allah, take refuge in the cave. Now, what, what you're seeing here, uh, what you're seeing here is um, the context, right? You're, you're, you're seeing they were in the cave and then they awoken, but now you're getting the context as to what got them in the cave, which is our main lesson. We're going to finish in a few minutes, inshallah. So, Stay awake. Pay attention. Um, you've distanced yourself from them, what they worship besides Allah. Take refuge in the cave. Next verse. You, Lord, your Lord will extend his mercy to you and accommodate you in your situation. And the final verse we want to address. And you would have seen the sun as it rose, inclining away from their cave to the right, and as it set, declining away from them to the left. So if we go to the verse 15 and 16, the previous verses. Um, remember, the people of the cave got there by saying, these people take gods besides him. 
Why do they not produce a clear proof of them? We'll take away the slide and let's talk about this lesson. The, 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 the people of the cave and the story of the people of the cave is not a story about running away from the challenges of life, okay? And the proof of that are these verse 15 and 16. The reason why they ended up in the cave was because of what they were doing before going to the cave. What was that? They were active in speaking against injustice, the height of which is kufr and shirk. They were active in holding accountable. And, you know, a lot say that the people of the cave, you know, was at the time uh, um, of the Roman Empire. And they were speaking truth to power. And they were uh, 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 active in forbidding wrong and in joining good until the emperor brought them forth and wanted to kill them. But he felt, funny enough, he felt it was bad PR because they were young. I mean, we, got, we, we, we don't want to kill them. Yeah, so he gave them, he gave them time. Right. So, you know, they were agitating power, agitating power, agitating power, as we should be doing in a way that is in line with our principles and ethics about what is happening. We should be doing exactly that. We should be agitating power. These elected officials are not elected by God. And it is our responsibility that if they uh, peddle hypocritical narratives and propaganda and they do not listen to the people, it is our responsibility to agitate them and to hold them accountable. And so they kept doing that until the emperor said, we've had enough, and he brought them forth to murder them. And then he said, before I kill you, I'm going to give you some time to think about this. Go and, in other words, repent, you know, go back and stop talking about Philistine, stop talking about the illegal occupation of Israel, you know, and then we'll, we'll be all right. Yeah, just stop, stop doing it. So that is that moment where they asked Allah for guidance and they ended up going to the cave and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them to sleep. Now, why, why is this important? The reason why this is important is because they exhausted all of their efforts that it was within their capacity before they fled that persecution, okay? Before they fled in the same way that the Prophet Sallallahu did in Mecca. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't flee Mecca in the first year of persecution. The Prophet Sallallahu remember, more of Islam was taught in Mecca than in Medina by, by time period, right? 13 years in Mecca, 10 years in, 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 in Medina, right? So the Dawah, what in, 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 in Mecca was a, a, a long period of time. And the lesson for that is that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sorry, you guys disappeared. Okay, there you are. <laughs> I was like, why is everything disappeared? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't just give up at the first sign of struggle. No, they continued and continued and continued. And then when did he make hijrah? The Prophet ﷺ gave permission for Hijra and made Hijra himself when it was becoming unbearable to the point where it was no longer in any way effective to remain in Mecca. And then they left Mecca. And despite leaving Mecca and going to Medina, they never forgot about their people in Mecca. And the Prophet ﷺ ended up coming back. And that's why we have Fatah Mecca in the last two years of the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad So my humble lesson and advice for you, and excuse the impassioned um, speech, subhanAllah, it's hard not to be passionate in a time like this. Um, may Allah keep us uh, ethical and allow us to maintain our etiquette, uh, uh, no matter what context we find ourselves in, because we are representing Islam, when we talk about anything and we have to make sure that those who are not Muslim on the fence, those who or even our enemies can look and say that is a dignified representation of Islam. So even our passion has to have limits.
But I want to leave you with a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Two hadith. And we're going to balance them in two minutes and then we end. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, المؤمن الذي يخالط الناس ويصبر على أذاهم أفضل من المؤمن الذي لا يخالط الناس ولا يصبر على أذاهم The believer that mixes with the people and is patient with their harm is better than the person who does not mix with the people and is not patient with their harm. What does this mean to us? The people of the cave, you know, they had patience. They continued in their activism in the same way that us in America have to continue. We have to continue with all those around us, with our elected officials, with our neighbors, with our cities, uh, with our own Muslims, you know. We have to continue and be patient upon their harm, hoping that, inshallah, our efforts, believing our efforts will make a difference and that people will come around. And as you can see, this is the first time in the history of this uh, 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 of the liberation struggle of Palestine that you see arguably the entire world, including the majority of Americans, standing with Palestine. This is a this is a karama of Allah. What a miracle! And this is a sign that the efforts have worked despite the pain. And I can't imagine the pain the Palestinians and those. Uh, 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 living in the Palestinian diaspora feel. I mean, I'm not, subhanAllah. I mean, Aqsa, is, is, as a Muslim, I, 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 I hurt. But imagine what they're facing. And yet they continued. People like, you know, Professor Noor Erkat, who I respect the analysis of a lot, you know, she, 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 she uh, left a, a different career to continue to just devote her whole life to this. And you could see in every appearance, holds accountable, you know, is patient, but is firm. And all of those efforts led to their fruits. Imagine if everyone just said, khalas, we're being persecuted, let's give up on the cause. Subhanallah. This is not what we learned from the people of the cave. This is not what we learned from the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu But at the same time, the Prophet Sallallahu in another hadith, he says that there will come a time that it is better for a Muslim <laughs> to just uh, herd goats in the, in the far off mountains. Okay? How do, we, how do we reconcile both? The reconciliation is that we try our best, okay, within our capacities to mix with people around us towards truth and justice, to guide them to that which is better for their souls and for society. But when it becomes too intense such that our own faith is being lost, that is when we consider going into the cave. And this is a great segue into our khutbah about self-care, our, our daily caves that we have to make to maintain momentum. Is that something we should do? Is self-care something we should not even think about in a time like this? Inshallah, we will address this in the khutbah and we will we will stop the reflections here. Barakallah fikum.